The beat started with a dog. Those characters are so endearing and entertaining, and you know, it's a great story. And to a large degree, that I mean, it, it, it's, the gameplay is based on the rhythm action mechanic. But what makes those games so appealing is the great characters and, and narrative. No one had seen anything like it before, um, and it was original and it was funny. Him with Parappa the Rapper is on the level. I mean, it's it's perhaps the first truly musical video game. And went on with a dance simulator. We basically brought the game here from Japan and made it popular. So we know what we're doing when it comes to these music games. Let's go behind the revolution. The personality of the game is just happiness. So the world is full of all these, you know, passionate air guitarists who, you know, would love to be able to make music and really just have no way to do that. I was really proud to work on something that people liked so much. Even if it didn't succeed financially as much as we would have liked, uh, I think critically people really, really appreciated it. This game is insane. The, the people who play it are insane, and watching someone play it is insane. And explore the rhythm of music games. Masaya Matsura, a popular Japanese recording artist, grows up with a variety of influences. I was dedicated to listening. When I was in junior high, I always listened to Led Zeppelin. And in high school, I listened to contemporary jazz, punk, progressive rock. So my tastes were very mixed, from different generations like the 60s and 70s to European, American, and Japanese music. Basically, I started my music career in 1984 by having my own band. I was signed with Sony Music. Masaya takes advantage of the available technology to enhance his sound and has an idea. So back then, I always felt frustrated with using ready-made software. You know, usually I'd have to use composing sequence software to make the music, but they weren't good enough to achieve my goals. So I felt the need to create new software to compose my own music. Asuya Matsura, who is a famous, uh, actually, well, actually not that famous, but he was a uh, guitar um, composer. He did music for guitar in Japan. When I realized that I could get something going in the game industry, I rushed into it. Matsura is tapped by Sony executives to create a game. Around 1993, I got a letter from Mariyama-san, who was the chairman at Sony Computer Entertainment. The letter said, I want you to make something on the PlayStation. That's it. And development of a secret project begins at Sony. So I started to think about something for the PlayStation and developed Parappa the Rapper. How am I going to pay for it? Almost no one knew about it. Toward the end of development, people still didn't think this was really a game. Everybody thought this was some kind of interactive music software. Just because the rhythm is slow, that don't mean that you can't flow. Uh, Parappa the Rapper was uh, actually another one of these uh, experimental games that came out of Sony Music. If you think about it, it's like a game like Parappa the Rapper is on the level, I mean, it's, it's perhaps the first truly musical video game. It's almost like a hip-hop Moulin Rouge sort of thing, you know what I mean? Where the, the music is so in there and it, it seriously enhances the gameplay, you know? It's the fact that you can play that game again and again and again because you want to hear those songs. I composed the music and I produced and created the game content. All right, we're here, just sitting in the car. I want you to show me if you can get far. Step on the gas. Step gas. Thanks to Technicolor environments, truly unique two-dimensional characters, and of course, it's catchy music. Parappa is an immediate success following its Japanese release in December 1996. The game sells nearly 800,000 copies. That's it for today. And opens up a whole new audience to gaming. It was so exciting because there was a woman at Sony who never played games, and when I saw her laugh and scream while playing Parappa at lunchtime, I felt something then. I think everybody at Sony felt something. They didn't have all the trappings of games. Uh, and a lot of people who weren't traditional gamers actually really got into that game and bought PlayStation, especially female gamers in Japan. In fall 1997, Parappa is introduced to American audiences. I mean, the Japanese market's so much different than the American market. And you've seen that consistently. I mean, for instance, a uh, great example is the Parappa the Rapper games. Huge overseas, but in the United States, it really didn't find an audience. I mean, it found a cult following in the US, but it was, it was mainstream fare. It was a top seller over there. And I think it's just the difference in cultural taste. I am the number one ruler of the seven seas. This skunk over here will bring you luck. 
Um, in the case of Parappa, really what those games are about are the, the character and the story. I mean, those characters are so endearing and entertaining, and you know, it's a great story. And to a large degree, that I mean, it, it, it's, the gameplay is based on the rhythm action mechanic. But what makes those games so appealing is the great characters and, and narrative. You want to sit there and make Parappa freestyle and make it sound different, and it's just it's so rewarding to have so much control over it. And the fact that they actually made the music a part of the gameplay. I mean, that game is truly visionary. The best thing is anybody in the world can play these games. Yeah, I know. I gotta believe. Other game companies take notice, like Konami with Beat Mania in 1998. And that was a uh, DJ simulation game in which a person would uh, press five keys according to the screen and scratch a turntable. And uh, when all done in rhythm, it would make music. That game, that caught on and eventually led to other music games and uh, got b Might as a, a general name for all of their music game series. And gamers get ready for a new revolution. In 1998, Konami takes the arcade success of Beat Mania and starts a revolution. Konami's been doing innovative arcade games for a number of years, and specifically, um, probably say in the last five years or so, Konami's really gotten good at, at peripherals and um, really, uh, I guess you call it tactile arcade experiences where you're using guns and you're using dance pads and uh, boxing gloves and things like that. Dance Dance Revolution is introduced in Japan and lures new audiences into arcades, largely thanks to DDR's unconventional interface. Honestly, it's just in innovative in the fact that there's no joystick, no buttons per se. It's basically pressurized floor panels. And the creative thing is like, you know, you can do up, left, down, right, but you can up with your hand, left, elbow, down, right, and just go with how you want to do it. And that's what makes it all creative. Dance Dance Revolution. Now, that was pretty humbling, because I know I can't dance already. And then I start playing Dance Dance Revolution thinking, wow, I can actually learn how to dance if I do this right. And I was just worse than I started after trying, trying to step here and move here. And it's just way too confusing and much too hard for me to play. But I know it's really popular. And it's, it's definitely fun watching other people play that. I remember the first time I was over in Japan and I saw Dance Dance Revolution and I thought someone was having like a conniption fit or something. I, I didn't know what was going on. I was about to call the police, like, is the dude having a seizure? DDR requires players to use their feet to press arrows on a dance pad as tunes blare. In DDR, um, you're not actually affecting or controlling the music. The music is playing and you're following along the way a dancer follows the music on a dance floor and that's what those games are about. I mean, what can you say about Dance Dance Revolution? Now, what are they up to, like, the 20th mix now? The, this game is insane. The, the people who play it are insane, and watching someone play it is insane. success of Dance Dance Revolution in Japan, Konami decides to bring the phenomenon to the U.S. market in March of 1998. Um, Konami America has had a history of, uh, of DDR in the U.S. We basically brought the game here from Japan and made it popular. So we know what we're doing when it comes to these music games. And it carries the Bimani line name, which is a pretty, pretty important name for the DDR series. DDR's popularity attracts a large fan base. And by 1999, 620 arcades nationwide reported having at least one DDR machine. It really started off slowly, kind of like it did in the arcades, where uh, you know it was a select few people that really knew about it, and really enjoyed it, and then pretty soon people realized that this is this is uh, crossing over into real life. I and mean, people know how to dance, and they don't have to be video game fans to do that. When you show people that are outside of the video game world something like this, it really seems to grow fairly quickly. And DDR becomes a spectator sport. I was a fan of console gaming at home, and so uh, yeah, I, uh, so I had a little bit of a taste of 
of the arcade, but uh, n uh, never anything to the extent of uh, rhythm games. And so, so I met an arcade one day with my friends, which happens to be at Disneyland. And my friends are like, wow, James, you should really give this a shot. And so I go up, I kind of have an idea of, of the first song, and then the second song, I totally bomb it. And by this time, I, there's probably 15, 20 people watching. But, uh, you know, I, I kind of got a rush. It's like, I get a rush, like, you know, having fun. And also, uh, I, I can find, I told myself, like, when I got off the machine, I was like, this is something I could get used to. I've been playing this game probably for about a year and a half. Um, I started playing when I actually saw people dance on the machine, and then I was all about it. You know, I thought, oh, you know, everyone looks stupid playing this. And now I'm like, oh, oh my god, moves. You know, what are you doing? What are you doing? And for some, DDR is more than just a game. And actually, this game for me came about because I got in a car accident, and after a little bit of a while, they said, you need to start getting to rehabilitative aerobic activity, and I remember this game, and that's how it came to be. It's a good, it's, it, that's one good video arcade game that I, that kids can exert their energy and, you know, actually getting some, uh, some uh, what do you call that, cardio exercise and stuff, you know. I've known people who've lost weight. There's one guy here where, he used to be 450 pounds. You went down to about 290. So, it is. So, what can you say? Jenny Craig ain't got nothing on this. In 1999, the revolution breaks out of arcades and into homes with Dreamcast and PlayStation versions. Dance Dance really kind of came out of the arcades. We, we um, a product manager here at Konami of America named Jason Enos, recognized the phenomenon of Dance Dance Revolution, not just in Japan, but also growing in arcades here in the U.S and um, they decided that it might make sense to try bringing the game to the home consoles. Right now, Dance Dance Revolution, um, for at least for PlayStation 2, we know, has been a very successful game for us. Building on the success of Beat Mania and Dance Dance Revolution, Konami releases more arcade games in their Bamani series. The Bamani series consists of, uh, of several different instrument uh, simulations, such as Keyboard Mania, which is a piano, Guitar Freaks for Guitar, Drum Mania, Beat Mania for turntables and uh, rhythm boxes. In 1999, Sega quickly follows with Space Channel 5. Space Channel 5 was very sexy. I mean, it was a great lead character that you really felt a lot of emotion to. You know, kind of a neat story there. Um, it was very stylized. and you know, we had some really great artists working on it. And you know, kind of took a lot of stylistic risks. And we wanted it to be a music game, which we were really much in tune with, but at the same time, be really turned on by the atmosphere of it. I mean, it was a very sexually charged game, I think very stylistically charged game. I don't really know what happened. I don't know why it didn't sell as well as it should have. I think it was probably marketed enough in Japan correctly. I just think uh, we were maybe appealing to a demographic that didn't exist enough yet. Samba de Amigo! And the highly original maraca shaking game, Samba de Amigo, for the Dreamcast. The personality of the game is just happiness, right? If you had to, if you had to put one word and you would describe Samba de Amigo as uh, overjoyed, happy. and. The barrier to entry in that game with the, with the maracas, especially at the maracas, the, the music uh, that goes with it and the silly monkey, you know, the, the, that wears a sombrero is just brilliant. You know, that game just speaks to what uh, uh, interactivity is all about. Although music games were gathering a huge following, were they selling well? The product wasn't uh, extremely commercially successful, and I think, um, you know, there are a number of possible explanations for this. Nice try, but maybe you should practice a little more. By 2002, music games were gaining popularity in pop culture. And with releases like Britney's Dance Beat for the PS2 and a Disney-themed version of DDR, it seemed like the genre was in danger of losing its edge but a number of original music titles are also released, like Rez. But we were going for a very pure feeling that hadn't been done in games yet. It was a new idea. It wasn't what people expected, and it was really hard to describe, but once people started playing it and understanding it, they loved it. I mean, there's a huge cult following. People love Rez. People that have played it, people that haven't played it, don't know about it, don't care about it, but it does have a big cult following. And Mad Maestro. Mad Maestro is great because people who aren't familiar maybe with classical music, this is a great way to actually learn. I mean, there's all these great from Beethoven, Mozart, Wagner, everybody's in there. And it's a great way to learn. You know, I love that game. What was really nice about that is it wasn't just timing, but you also had to do dynamics. So you could, if depending on how hard you hit the button, you could play the music softer or louder. 
Uh, even if you hit it too fast and the music actually sped up or slowed down depending on if you were right on the rhythm or not. So you really got interactive with the music and you didn't even have to follow what they wanted you to do. With most of the music games being developed overseas, American Alex Rogopoulos saw a chance to change music games with his new company, Harmonix. My background actually was not in video games at all other than as a player, but in uh, computers and music. I was at MIT for seven years studying music composition and also computer music at the computer music group of the Media Lab at MIT. And uh, it was there that I met Iran Gozi, who was uh, a brilliant programmer and also an accomplished musician uh, with whom I started the company back in 1995. And uh, we were both very motivated to work on what we perceived to be a huge problem in the world, which is that playing music is one of the most kind of primitively joyful experiences that life has to offer. And almost nobody gets to actually experience this because it's just so damn difficult to play a musical instrument. And just about everybody tries at some point to learn to play an instrument, you know, guitar lessons as a teenager or piano lessons or whatever. And almost all of those people give it up a few months later in frustration just because it's so hard and so frustrating. And so the world is full of all these, you know, passionate air guitarists who, you know, would love to be able to make music and really just have no way to do that. So we created this company initially not to make video games at all, but to create new kinds of interactive music experiences to let people who are not musicians have access to this kind of unique pleasure that comes from making music. We made a decision to become the company that pushed music gaming to the next level and brought it to the North American market. And so, at that point, we recruited a game development team, uh, came up with a design, prototyped an idea, and brought it to Sony back in 1999, I think. Uh, pitched it to them and they got it to their credit uh, given how weird it was and uh, we began developing it for the PlayStation 2 and finally brought it to market in the fall of 2001 as Frequency. In terms of uh, critical acclaim, the product couldn't have done much better. We won, a ton, you know, frothing at the mouth positive reviews. We won a ton of awards, including a British Academy Award. Uh, and anyone who actually uh, tried and bought the game loved it. We have a mountain of fan mail for people who, you know, picked it up, uh, you know, more than a year ago and who are still playing it to this day. Um, the product wasn't uh, extremely commercially successful, and I think, um, you know. There are a number of possible explanations for this. Um, one is that a lot of people never really even gave it a try. The game is sufficiently uh, is sufficiently unusual looking, and I think if you just glance at a screenshot, um, it's very easy to not really recognize what it is and just say, no, oh, that's weird, and kind of flip the page and move on to the next thing. The next thing for harmonics was the highly addictive sequel to Frequency, Amplitude. Um, with Amplitude, it's a, it's a great music game simply because you get to actually construct the song. Um, they have like the drum phrases separated from, from the lyrical phrases, from the, from the bass phrases. And uh, you just go through and, and string everything together. It's, it's this really great game for, for those enthusiasts that love to really get into the song. Like where they actually listen to the lyrics and they listen to the, the guitar riffs. With Amplitude, uh, we really wanted to, I mean, there's still a, a, you know, a healthy dose of electronica in the game, but we also really wanted to open up the appeal of the music to a much broader audience. So there's also a lot of rock and hip hop from a really pretty stunning roster of mainstream bands in the game. After trying rock and roll with Um Jammer Lammy, Masaya Matsura returns with a dog that started it all. I started working for Rafa the Rapper in 93, and it was finally released at the end of 96. We spent more than two and a half years on it, so I got tired of listening to hip hop. I wanted something different, so in Umjammer Lamy, we used rock music. It's based on the guitar playing game. We tried new things on it, like having real time guitar effects by using the analog stick as a whammy pedal effect. And after that, we moved on to Parappa 2 for the PlayStation. Namco takes the wildly successful arcade experience of Taiko no Tatsuden and rushes it into Japanese homes in 2002 with a portable drum peripheral. And with the release of Donkey Konga from Nintendo, it seems that music games will continue to innovate and entertain. We were very inspired by the Japanese music games because I think just that core rhythm action mechanic is extremely addictive and really, I think, authentically emulates the buzz of, of playing live, live music. I think music games are here to stay. I think they have maybe yet to reach their true place in the world of entertainment media. Music is an important ingredient for various kinds of media. So now, 
more developers are aware of the role music plays. Still, many developers don't care about sound even though sound is one of the most important elements in the game. Soon though, everybody will realize the importance of sound. I wish Res would be re-released. I think people still, you know, continue to experience it to this day. And a lot of people I meet, you know, they, they love it. They think Res is just the coolest thing ever. And, you know, they, they want the next one to come out. And uh, I'm sorry, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. But I hope everybody enjoys it. I was really proud to work on something that people like so much. Even if it didn't succeed financially as much as we would have liked, uh, I think critically people really, really appreciated it. So I was really proud to be a part of that. It's something that people can really benefit from. It's, it's good for all ages. They're really easy to catch on to. Even though they have really simple concepts, people like to play for the music just to show off in an arcade. People could also use uh, B-Money and other music games as a source for like uh, uh, bringing good goodness to the youth so that like it would be like a good influence, which is uh, something I would like to do. Show people that, you know, music, having music in your life is really great. And that, uh, you know, it's, it's, some people just play just for their love of music. This is, this is, this is, this is.